The past 150 years of archaeology in the Near East have revolutionized our understanding of the Bible and ancient Israelite culture. We now know that several of the foundational myths in Genesis, particularly the creation of the world and Noah's Ark, were predated by Sumerian, Assyrian, Babylonian, and Canaanite versions of those same stories. The parallels between the flood narrative of Genesis and the flood myths found in Eridu Genesis, Atrahasis, and the Epic of Gilgamesh are particularly striking, leaving no room for doubt that the scribes who penned the Bible were indebted to the rich literary heritage of ancient Mesopotamia. Finding Near Eastern parallels to the story of the Garden of Eden, however, has always been more difficult. What ancient sources of inspiration lie behind this tale? Did the so-called Yahwist writer invent the characters of Adam and Eve himself? Or did he borrow them from earlier traditions? And how did a snake manage to infiltrate the Holy Garden and upset God's plans? In this documentary, we turn our sights to one of the Bible's most foundational stories and its origins in the culture and literature of ancient Canaan and Mesopotamia. The sacred garden, the tree of life, the creation of humans, and many other elements of the Eden story have well-known antecedents in the myths and art of Israel's older neighbors. What's more, according to a theory by Old Testament scholars Mario Korpel and Johanna C. Demore, even the story of Adam and the serpent has a direct precursor in an obscure text from ancient Ugarit. If correct, their theory would be a major step forward in tracing the beliefs and myth that shaped the Bible. At the time when Yahweh God made the earth and the heaven, there was at yet no wild bush on the earth, nor had any wild plant yet sprung up, for Yahweh God had not sent rain on the earth, nor was there any man to till the soil. However, a flood was rising from the earth and watering all the surface of the soil. Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden, which is in the east, and there he put the man he had fashioned. The ancient Sumerian myth of Inki and Ninhursag recounts a story about the ancient land of Dilmun before it was inhabited. Virginal is Dilmun land. Pristine is Dilmun land. In Dilmun, a raven was not yet cawing. A partridge not cackling. A lion did not yet slay. A wolf did not carry off lambs. Ninsikala said to her father Inki, a city you gave, a city that has no river? You gave me a city, a city that has no field, glebe or furrow? Inki answered Ninsikala, from the mouth of the running underground waters, fresh waters shall run out of the ground for you. At the beginning of the story, Dilmun is a parched desert devoid of plants and animals, so the goddess of Dilmun, Ninsikala, asks the high god Inki to supply water. Inki hears her plea and causes springs of fresh water to appear on Dilmun, making it inhabitable. Inki also fertilizes the land with his semen so he can bring forth plants. This is reminiscent of the opening verses of Genesis 2 in which the newly created land is devoid of plants until a spring is produced to water the ground. Yahweh then plants a garden in the east, 
causing the soil to bring forth trees of every kind. Dilmun was apparently a real place, and most scholars believe it referred to the island of Bahrain, which was home to a rich commercial civilization for thousands of years. The myth of Inki and Ninhursag may have originated as an etiology for this wealthy kingdom and its abundant freshwater springs. However, in these texts, we also see the development of a mythical Dilmun, which is not the island of Bahrain at all, but a mountain in the east where the sun rises. Eridu Genesis, the Sumerian flood myth, states that the flood hero Ziud Sudra, the Sumerian Noah, was taken there to enjoy eternal life. Ziud Sudra, being king, stepped up before An and Enlil, kissing the ground. And An and Enlil, after honoring him, were granting him life, like a god's, were making lasting breath of life, like a god's descend into him. That day they made Ziud Sudra, preserver as king, of the name of the small animals and the seed of mankind. Live toward the east over the mountains in Mount Dilmun. The later Akkadian epic of Gilgamesh confirms that the flood hero is taken to live in a mythical land beyond the mountains at the source of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Even though the name Dilmun is no longer used to reach this land, Gilgamesh must accomplish feats impossible for ordinary mortals, traveling beyond even where the sun rises to the very edge of the world. Could this Mount Dilmun be a precursor to the biblical Eden? The scholarly position on this is complicated. Some experts like Dina Katz and Bernard Bato argue that Dilmun is a weak parallel to the Garden of Eden Bato says, there is no indication that humans, even primeval humans, ever lived there with the lone exception of the divinized flood hero, an exception which proves the rule. Arthur and Alina George, on the other hand, believe that several elements of the Eden story have direct parallels in the Dillman myth. We do not argue that Jay specifically utilized or even knew of all the above mentioned Dilmun myths when composing the Eden story. But it is apparent that these motifs existed throughout the biblical world. Much of it was archetypal. It appears that Eden, like the mythical Dilmun, is also located on a mountain. In Genesis 2, four rivers originate in Eden, the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. The headwaters of rivers are usually found in mountains because rivers obviously flow downhill. Furthermore, Ezekiel 28, which preserves a separate and possibly earlier Eden myth, explicitly refers to Eden as a garden on the holy mountain of God. Corporal and Demor also argue in their book that it is logical to locate Eden near the site where Noah's Ark was stranded in the mountains of Ararat, far to the northeast of Israel. Even if the Sumerian myth of Dilmun lies in the background of Eden, there might also be parallels closer to home. In the tablets of Ugarit, an important Canaanite city-state, predated the Israelites, we find references to a sacred mountain with a vineyard where El or Elu, the high god of the Canaanite pantheon, resided. And Yahweh Elohim made to grow out of the ground all trees pleasant to look at and good for food and the tree of life in the middle of the garden, and the tree of knowing good and evil. The tree of life motif is well known from Mesopotamian art, 
Assyrian reliefs and cylinder sills frequently show a sacred tree, typically a date palm, being guarded by Apkalus, or hybrid birdmen. According to Helga S. Kwamvig, the Assyrian Tree of Life represented the divine world order maintained by the king. Sacred trees were also a common aspect of religious life in ancient Canaan. Most rural religious activity took place at sanctuaries called Bamot, or high places, which are mentioned frequently in the Bible. These were typically situated near prominent trees on hills or high ground. Eating the fruit of a sacred tree was a direct way of experiencing the divine. Outside of Genesis, sacred trees are often associated with the goddess Asherah, who also went by the name Elat, the feminine version of El. The historical books of the Old Testament imply that Asherah veneration was practiced in Judah, and even at the Jerusalem temple, without interruption until the reforms of Hezekiah and Josiah. Archaeological finds from various sites in Judah and Israel confirm her popularity and her association with a sacred tree. It was also the case in Anatolian and Syrian art that the storm god Hadad often carried a tree or a tree branch, and this became a divine symbol of the god's fertility as the one who caused the rains by which the earth's plants and trees were nourished. Over time, the sacred tree by itself came to represent Hadad. Another version of the Tree of Life that is surely connected to the Eden story comes from Greek mythology. According to numerous Greek authors, there were several nymphs called the Hesperides who tended a garden at the western edge of the world. This garden belonged to the goddess Hera and contained a sacred tree that produced magical fruit made of gold. To prevent the Hesperides from picking the fruit themselves, Hera placed a multi-headed serpent named Ladon. The name Ladon almost certainly comes from Lotan, the seven-headed chaos serpent of Canaanite, Syrian, and Hittite tradition. This serpent appears in numerous ancient Bible passages as Leviathan, a multi-headed sea dragon vanquished by Yahweh at creation. Exactly how all these dots connect, however, is difficult to determine. Did the Yahwist author know both the Canaanite sacred garden tradition and the Greek Hesperides tradition? Or did both the Israelites and the Greeks inherit the garden, tree, fruit, and serpent motifs from a Near Eastern source? These questions remain unanswered for now, but we will have more to say about the serpent further on. What is distinctive about most examples of sacred gardens and trees is their link to the earth goddess. The Eden story, however, was written by scribes of a religion that venerated primarily Yahweh, and as such, it features no goddess. Nevertheless, aspects of the earlier goddess mythology might still remain, as we shall see. Despite the ubiquitous appearance of divine trees with a variety of symbolic meanings in the ancient Near East, one of the biggest challenges in finding a direct predecessor for the Eden story is the unique function of the two trees, the Tree of Life, which confers immortality, and the Tree of Knowledge, which as its name implies, confers knowledge. However, other well-known myths provide a suitable background for these elements. The ancient Mesopotamian myth of Adapa tells a story in which Adapa, the king of Eridu, is brought before the court of heaven and offered the food and drink of the gods, which will make him immortal. The god Ea, however, uses trickery to convince Adapa to refuse the offer and remain Ea's mortal servant on earth. 
the main innovation required by the Yahwist author was to combine the idea of a sacred fruit-bearing tree with the idea that the food of the gods granted immortality in those who ate it. Similarly, the tree of knowledge from which Eve eats is reminiscent of Pandora's so-called box, actually a jar. Like Eve, Pandora was the first woman to be created in Greek mythology. And like Eve, Pandora brought sorrow and calamity into the world by opening the forbidden jar. The tree of knowledge, in a sense, is just Pandora's jar in another form. Yahweh Elohim formed the human of dust from the ground and breathed into his nose life's breath, and the human became a living being. The creation of humans from dirt or clay is not unique to Genesis. It is a ubiquitous idea found throughout the Mediterranean and the Near East. An ancient myth called Enma, which is known from both Sumerian and Akkadian tablets, describes how after the creation of the world, the lesser gods tire of their toil and say they need laborers to do their work for them. So, Inki gives Nama, the mother goddess, instructions for mixing clay with his blood to create humans. A similar story is told in Atrahasis, the Akkadian creation and flood epic. This story also begins with the lesser gods complaining about the toil of farming. So Inki instructs the mother goddess to create humans from clay mixed with the blood of a slain god and saliva from the other gods. Berossus, the Babylonian historiographer of the Hellenistic period, similarly described the creation of humans from dirt and the blood of a slain god. This god Kingu took off his own head and the other gods gathered up the blood which flowed from it and mixed the blood with earth and formed men. For this reason, men are intelligent and have a share of divine wisdom. The Greeks adopted the same myth. Prometheus is said to have formed men out of clay, while the goddess Athena breathed life into them. The logic in such stories seems to be that human-shaped figurine can be created from clay or inanimate matter, but some essence of the gods, blood, in many cases, is needed to give it life. In the Genesis story, the breath of Yahweh accomplishes this. Interestingly, when we consider the parallels between how Yahweh and Prometheus created the first man, and how both Eve and Pandora were responsible for unleashing misfortune on the world through their curiosity, it might be this Greek myth that is closest to the Eden story. Historian Jan Bremer acknowledges these parallels in his book, Greek Religion and Culture, the Bible and the Ancient Near East. But he suggests that both the Greeks and the Hebrews were drawing on Near Eastern myths. In an article for the website Mythology Matters, historian Arthur George argues that the Serpent of Eden is adapted from the West Semitic myth of the Chaos Dragon, Lotan or Leviathan. He believes the serpent represents the chaos in Eve's heart. Yahweh's eventual punishment of the serpent represents a mini version of the dragon combat motif. Other scholars see a connection with the serpent and the Epic of Gilgamesh. In this famous and wildly popular Babylonian text, Gilgamesh visits the paradise of Dilmun at the edge of the world to ask the flood hero Utnapishtim about the secret to immortality. Utnapishtim reveals the existence of a magical plant in the sea that can grant immortality but after Gilgamesh acquires it, a snake steals the plant and eats it, whereupon it sloughs off its skin. 
This ability of snakes, by the way, was one of the reasons they were associated with immortality by the ancients. Thus, a snake prevents Gilgamesh from eating the plant of life and living forever. It's not hard to find close points of similarity between the Gilgamesh story and Eden. There is no Adam and Eve, but the parallels to the Tree of Life and the crafty serpent are obvious. Corporal and Amor acknowledge the Gilgamesh epic and its importance for understanding the Garden of Eden story. However, they believe that the closest predecessor to the biblical story can be found in two obscure tablets from Ugarit known as KTU-1-100 and KTU-1-107. Their view has not been widely accepted in academia, at least not yet. But regardless of whether or not they are correct, these tablets are interesting in their own right and may challenge how we understand the Eden story. KTU-1-100 is more or less fully intact, but very difficult to interpret. KTU-1-107 is highly fragmentary and, not surprisingly, also hard to make sense of. The two tablets, which were found together in the ruins of Ugarit, are understood to be related and possibly even part of the same text. KTU-1-100 is sometimes overlooked as a mere incantation for snake bites. But according to Ugaritic expert Gregorio del Almo Leite, it is actually a canonical mythical text about magic and the power of incantation. It begins with an appeal from an unnamed goddess described as the daughter of Shapsu and the daughter of Sky and Deep to the high god El, originally pronounced Elu in Ugaritic, who lives at the fountainhead of the two rivers at the confluence of the two floods. The rivers are undoubtedly the Tigris and Euphrates, and the two floods are probably the cosmic waters of heaven and the deep which meet at the edge of the world. Elu's location sounds much like both Eden and Dilmun in these details. The emergency is that a serpent has invaded the land and bitten someone or something. The goddess systematically calls upon one Canaanite deity after another. Baal, Dagon, Anat, Reshef, and so on, asking for their help to come and destroy the serpent and expel the poison. None of the gods and goddesses is able or willing to do so. Finally, she asks Horanu for help. Perhaps you haven't heard of Horanu. Most people haven't. He was a god of the underworld, but he wasn't well liked at Ugarit and did not receive sacrifices there. Other texts tell us that he was the chief of demons, and perhaps serpents. Thus, he could not only control them to punish people, but he could also protect people from them. Despite his negative aspects, Horanu was venerated at various sites across Canaan, and two cities in the Israelite heartland, Upper Beth Haron and Lower Beth Haron, were named after him presumably because a sanctuary to Horanu was located there. He was also known in Egypt, where he was often conflated with Horus and represented as a falcon. So Horanu comes to the aid of the goddess. He travels to the Tigris River and uproots some kind of tree of death. In doing so, he makes the venom of the serpent disappear saving the garden. This is followed by a wedding ceremony in which Horanu gives the goddess serpents as a dowry. What's going on in this strange myth is far from obvious. Corporal and Demor believe that Horanu is the god of serpents 
and therefore the one originally responsible for the serpent attack in the garden. This, they say, is what is meant by a line that says Horanu came to the goddess's aid because he, she, would be bereaved of his, her offspring. With the implied subject being Horanu, other interpreters think it is the goddess whose offspring is in jeopardy. The role of the tree is similarly disputed. Corporal and Demore think it is the tree of life which has been turned into a tree of death by the serpent's venom and must be removed by Horanu. Others think Horanu is simply using a tree branch as a magic wand to nullify the serpent's venom. Every aspect of this myth is debated, but there is another important Eden parallel we'll come back to. The second tablet of interest, KTU, 1107 appears to take place in the Vineyard of the Gods, which is undoubtedly the Ugaritic equivalent of Eden. In the opening lines, which are highly fragmentary, a character named Adamu appears and is seemingly attacked by a serpent. At least, that's how Corporal and Demore interpret the text. A bit later on, the serpent's victim is referred to by the name Sharugazizu, as he is overcome by poison, he calls out to Shapsu, the sun goddess. After a long lacuna in the text, Shapsu summons Horanu to come and bind the serpent. Horanu appears to dispel the poison, while Shapsu removes a malevolent fog that has covered the mountains. The ending is too damaged to know what happens to Adamu and Sharugazizu. It's easy to see what drew Corporal and Demore to this tablet. We have an Edenic vineyard of the gods, an attack by a serpent, and most importantly, a character named Adamu, which is equivalent to the Hebrew name Adam. These two authors further argue that Adamu here is a divine man sent to the sacred vineyard to save the tree of life from the serpent and prevent the poisoning of the world. They even believe they have identified several cylinder seals from Cyprus, showing a three-headed serpent attacking Adamu. Unfortunately, it is difficult to get many to agree with their interpretation since the surviving fragments of KTU-1107 do not mention a tree or explain what Adamu's role in the story is. Nevertheless, the appearance of the name Adamu in a story about the Divine Garden and a serpent is interesting. Who is this Adamu? Is there any reason to think he or she is actually connected to the Biblical Adam? Ancient texts from Ugarit, Ebla, Anatolia, and even Egypt make occasional reference to a mysterious deity named Adama or Adamu. The exact spelling varies. In some of these earlier texts, Adama is clearly a goddess and the consort of Resheth, the god of the underworld. Later, however, in Anatolia and Ugarit, Adamu is usually paired with the goddess Kubaba, who eventually becomes Sibylle, the mother goddess of the Phrygians. Whether this version of Adamu at Ugarit is male, female, or even androgynous is unclear. Although there are a number of theories about the origins of Adama, the dominant view, according to Franz van Koppen and Carol van der Torn, and their article for the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible is that the name means soil or earth and would have been fitting for a goddess associated with the underworld. Furthermore, Francesco Espesi, an expert in Semitic linguistics, believes that the Hebrew word Adam, which also happens to mean soil or earth, 
is in fact demythologized version of the goddess Adamu, just as the name of the Syro-Canaanite god Reshef often appears in the Bible as a term for plague and destruction. This means that even if Corporal and Demore are mistaken about KTU-1107 as a direct predecessor of the Eden story, the ancient Syro-Canaanite earth deity Adama might still be lurking in the background of the Eden story, and the first man, whose name Adam, represents the Hebrew words for both man and soil. And as we have already seen, earth mother goddesses are a frequent element of Near Eastern creation stories involving the forming of humans from clay. Eve, whose name simply means life, would correspond to the mother goddess Kubapa, or Sibylle, in the Eden story, albeit in humanized form. Those of us raised on the Bible and Christian theology are so used to thinking of the Eden story in terms of human sin, human weakness, and human failure, that we rarely notice where the real failure of this story lies. If we revisit Genesis chapters 2 and 3, without these theological preconceptions, the story is a rather startling admission of the limitations of the Creator himself. Yahweh has planted a wondrous garden, but needs someone to till it, so he forms a creature from clay. To make it come alive, he must breathe his own breath into it. But the newly created man is lonely, which Yahweh has failed to anticipate. Yahweh tries to solve the problem by creating the animals, but these prove inadequate. Yahweh finally creates a suitable companion in the form of Eve. Yahweh's failure does not end there, however, for a crafty serpent infiltrates the divine garden and tricks Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. It is Eve's own God-given human nature that makes her curious about the fruit and susceptible to the serpent's influence. The dominoes continue to fall, as Adam also eats the fruit and Yahweh's entire plan for a man to till his garden is completely ruined. Left with no means to remedy the situation, Yahweh banishes the humans from his garden. If the story of Eden is about anything at all, surely it is about how even the plans of a god can go horribly wrong. Not everything is under the control of the divine. Reframed in this manner, the Ugaritic myth on the tablet KTU-1100 is in fact remarkably similar. According to the aforementioned Ugaritic scholar Del Almo Leite, this text is a myth about magic. It means to show that at the dawn of creation, magic existed as something outside the powers of the gods who created and ruled the earth. Those gods were powerless to protect the land against evil creatures. And when a serpent came and poisoned the garden, they could do nothing to stop it. Only Haranu, an underworld deity with no sacrificial cult or place in the pantheon, knew the proper magical incantations to dispel the serpent and its poison. It is the same with the Ugaritic story of Baal and his fight against the sea dragon Lotan. Lotan is not part of Elu's creation. He exists as part of the primordial chaos that is outside of the created order. Leviathan, the biblical chaos serpent fought by Yahweh in many places like Psalm 74, Psalm 89, and Isaiah 27 is no different. He is a primordial power that exists outside of Yahweh's will and that opposes Yahweh's created order. The serpent in the Garden of Eden also represents that same primordial power, a chaotic threat present at the beginning of history that Yahweh himself was unable to stop. Even the tree of life that Yahweh planted in the garden was able to produce effects against Yahweh's will 
As Del Amo Leite puts it, the main difference between Israelite and Ugaritic theology lies in how this ancient conflict was resolved. In KTU 1100, Haranu marries the sky goddess and gives her serpents as wedding gifts, thus uniting heaven with the underworld and bringing this primeval magic, this second power, under the control of the gods. The Israelite solution, on the other hand, was to reject the practice of magic. Del Amo Leite summarizes, In any case, it is clear that the primitive two-power system is incorporated, more or less, in the religious conception. In Ugarit, by accepting an independent magical power, in Israel, by rejecting it. Yet for centuries, it remained active in religious praxis and was ingrained in Israel's conception of origins and of the resulting ethical world. The origin and persistence of evil is affirmed through the assumption of a primordial agent system that cannot be easily reduced to a unique divine protagonist. In the final analysis, the search for a perfect Near Eastern parallel to the Garden of Eden story still eludes us. The theory of Corporal and Damor that the tablets of Ugarit preserve a direct predecessor to this tale is intriguing, but must be viewed with skepticism, unless a more complete version of the text can be found. Even so, practically every element of the story has well-established predecessors in the myths of the nations that surrounded Israel, and Adam himself has a plausible origin in Adama, the earth goddess. The version of Genesis we possess today, however, was written centuries or even millennia later than the earliest myths about primeval Dillon, the creation of humans from clay, the tree of life, and hostile serpents. The preference for a single national god over the traditional pantheon of Canaanite deities necessitated a new approach to the older myths, and yet those myths never went away completely. The deeper we investigate the stories of the Bible, the more we are reminded of that fact. <laughs>